Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, the show that takes you on a journey to the automotive world. We talk about the latest news, from new makes and models, to new technology, to all of the must-have options available. Whether you're a fan of the old classics, love the latest models and technology, or have never met a vehicle you didn't want to work on, the GSMC Car Podcast has something for every car enthusiast. Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, David Lucy Mabel. All right, today, folks, we are going to continue our series on the most influential car of every decade. If you have been keeping up with us so far since the launch of our Instagram account back in early January, last month now, now that it is February, um, we have been doing a podcast on the most influential cars of each decade. We did the car of the 1880s, which was the first car ever made, the Benz Patent Motor Wagon. We have done um, the car of the 1890s, which I believe was the 1894 Dury Motor Wagon. We did the car of the 1900s, which was the Ford Model T. We did the car of the 1910s, which I believe was, oh dear... I can't quite remember what the car of the 1910s was. Let me look it up real quick. Ah, the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. How could I forget? And then we did the car of the 1920s, which was the Duesenberg Model J. Okay, so now just to give you some perspective, the 1920s are over. The Roaring Twenties are over. 1929 has hit. The stock market crash is ever present and then now it's 1930 in the height of the great depression what were people doing in the car world at the time did they stop producing cars absolutely not and i will tell you that the most influential car of the 1930s by my own estimation is the 1934 to 1937 chrysler airflow this is something this is something of a very very underrated classic car. A lot of people don't know about this car and frankly it was not the most commercially successful car, which is something that makes me very sad, but nonetheless we're going to get started. So in segment 1, we are going to be discussing the history of the Chrysler Airflow. I'm going to be introducing it to you. In segment two, we're going to be talking about the numerous specifications of this car and really what made it so unique and influential. In segment three, we're going to be taking a look at some of the other cars that were being produced by other companies during this time period, as well as some of the history that was going on to really put the 1930s into perspective for you. And then in segment four, as always, you will hear my own thoughts. So let's get started. Okay, so uh, the Chrysler Airflow was actually a car that was rebadged under several Chrysler brands at the time period. It was essentially the same car as the DeSoto Airflow. And this was just a result of badge engineering, as a matter of fact. Badge engineering um, may not ring familiar to everybody, especially fledgling car enthusiasts who haven't heard much about it. But let me explain you what badge engineering is. Badge engineering is really what it sounds like. It's a car that's been made by a company that is released under several badges. For example, off the top of my head, a familiar example to people out there, whether they be privy to the car world or not, is the Chrysler minivans as of recent history. For example, you had the Chrysler Town and Country and you had the Dodge Grand Caravan. For their entire history, they've been the same vehicle mechanically the same, physically 
slightly different uh, with some front end and some rear end changes and maybe some different interior treatments, but the bones of the car remain the same. And in the days of the Plymouth Voyager, the Plymouth Voyager fell underneath that same belt too. That is a classic example of badge engineering. Um, there are certain other examples, but really that's the one that is the most relatable, is the one that, you know, I guess most comes to mind when you are thinking of badge engineering and how exactly it works in the in the real world is uh, an example of the Chrysler minivans. And keeping with the Chrysler theme, we are discussing a Chrysler product that has not been forgotten so much, but has been largely unsung. It's like people know it exists, but it's not that big of a deal, which I find absolutely crazy. Why isn't this car a big deal? I don't know why, but it's just not a big deal. Maybe it's because they didn't produce a ton of them. I mean, they produced, you know, over 30,000 of the Chrysler, mo uh, almost 30,000 of the Chrysler model. And uh, Chrysler, you know, DeSoto far outsold Chrysler as far as the airflow went, and they could have sold maybe 30,000 of those if I'm just going to, you know, give a ballpark estimate, or maybe 40, 50,000. So these cars, it's not like they were really, really, really rare. Like, there is enough of them. So why don't we hear more about them? Well, let me give you, let me give you a reason. So, uh, besides just being essentially the same car in a, uh, uh, um, badge engineering uh, scenario here. The DeSoto Airflow was produced from 1934 to 1936, and the Chrysler from 1934 to 1937. It was largely regarded, and this is what makes it so influential and important, it was largely regarded as the first major attempt at an aerodynamic automobile design. As the name would suggest, this car was designed to be aerodynamic, for the air to literally flow over it. Because cars of the time period, this was before the advent of something that we call today pontoon styling. Go and take a look at a modern car. Your fenders are all flush with the automobile. Your headlights are flush. Your taillights are flush. Almost everything is flush with the car, and there is a single straight, unbroken line on most cars, except for the mirrors, from the front fender to the rear fender. You don't have different things popping out. Your headlights aren't freestanding. You don't have a super tall radiator grill in the front. All the cars have been basically molded so that everything fits into one nice package and it's streamlined as far as modern cars go. The 1930s, this was, uh, this, this car was one of the first attempts really at pontoon styling coming from a major American car company. In the time period, and as you would remember from other cars that we've done, these cars look distinctly different from cars nowadays. They have fenders that are separate from the body. They are separate units from the body that can easily be dismounted. Headlights are freestanding, tall radiator grill, and largely a two-box design. You had your engine and your hood compartment up front, and then you had the cabin in the back. The DeSoto and the Chrysler Airflow completely revolutionized this. This was some of the first, I guess, pontoon styling from an American car company. Everything was flush with the body of the car. There were no freestanding headlights. There was not a super tall grill that stood up like a sore thumb at the front. The windshield, instead of being flat and creating major wind resistance, was split in two. And then it was raked at such a way that it would create a V so it would cut through the air as you were driving it. These cars were designed in wind tunnels. They were purpose-built to be aerodynamic. And that's exactly what they were. So now, keep in mind, this is the 1930s in which cars of this time period are not like this. They're not like this. In fact, they are starkly different. 
starkly different, decidedly different, unapologetically different. And then here Chrysler comes so ahead of its time and then completely revolutionizes. Literally, the way that they had to manufacture this car was so different from the way that they had to manufacture all of their other cars. Because really, most of Chrysler car at the time, Chrysler's cars, not Chrysler car, plurals, uh, most of Chrysler's cars at the time were still being produced under the traditional methods. So they had to learn new ways to weld the cars, new ways of manufacturing the car, new ways of tooling the factories in order to accommodate this revolutionarily different car. I mean, this was this was not a small production. And this is what the Chrysler Airflow meant. And also for a lesser reason, as a side note, as I've already mentioned, um, it was one of the, it was um, influential for another reason, because it was one of the first instances of badge engineering in the automotive world. Not to say that badge engineering hadn't existed before then, but this was one of the first instances of it. Typically, I could take GM as an example. Typically of that time period, Chrysler's, or not Chrysler, Chrysler's not GM, Chrysler's Chrysler. Um, Cadillacs did not share components with Chevys, even though they were all produced by the same company by this point in time. Each lineup in GM was still very distinct and very different. Chrysler had done this as a way to save money, and part of it maybe might have come back and bite them in the rear end, as you will soon find out in later segments. So these cars were were some of the... I, I, I just I can't stress this enough. Revolutionary. Let me get you, let, let me give you this. These cars were also some of the earliest examples of mass produced unibody cars in the United States as well. They were very ahead of their time, though they were and they were critically acclaimed by car reviewers of the time. But the public wasn't convinced, however, and the airflow ultimately failed. You know, their story is reminiscent of the Tucker 48, or as many people know it, as the Tucker Torpedo. They were simply too ahead of their time. The public wasn't ready to receive a car that was this revolutionary. Think about this. And you will hear me mention this later on in my own thoughts and even discussing the specifications of the car. These cars were extremely modern. And I'm not talking about modern for their time alone. They were extremely modern by today's standards. If you look at this car on a piece of paper, you would think it's a modern car. When you hear the specifications, when you hear weight distribution, when you hear that it was aerodynamically designed with pontoon styling, when you, were see, when you would see that it was all steel construction and that it was a unibody car, and that it handled properly, and that it was well-balanced, and it had a powerful engine. I mean, this is something that you expect of cars nowadays. You don't expect it from a car of the 1930s, which really, it, it almost irks me. And history doesn't typically irk me. You know, for me, I'm a fatalist. It is what it is at the end of the day. If fate would have it, let so be it. But... This irks me. This car was objectively better than almost anything else that was being created at the time period. Like, this is the 1930s. This is the 1930s. The Duesenberg Model J that we had discussed in the last episode was still being produced then. And Rolls-Royce was making cars. Cadillac was making cars. And you know what I say to all of those cars? They, you could forget about them. The Chrysler Airflow was objectively better than all of them. I'm not just saying that because I am a fan of this car. Because you all know me. I don't like Chrysler. At least modern Chrysler, I don't like them. But this car was objectively better. Unbetter, better on paper. Better in handling. Better in practicality. Better in design. Better in construction. Better in construction. 
better in reliability, better in safety, better in every single way imaginable. And frankly, it was better looking. And the public just didn't want anything to do with it. It, it, it frustrates me. It's as if though, it's as if though the people were just so severely closed-minded and closed off at the time period to the idea of something new, even though it was objectively better, it's that they were not, they were not dealing with it. Like, I know I'm one to speak. I had a podcast on how modern cars weren't as reliable as cars of old, but I had reasoning behind that. I had reasoning and I had evidence. When you get cars that won't start because the car doesn't recognize the key as an electronic key, that's a problem. Because if you had a car from the 90s before electronic keys were a thing, all you would have had to do was stick your car in the stick your key in the ignition and then turn it. And then your car was happy to go. That's not reliable. I had a reason why I don't care much for the modern technology in cars. But this, this of the, this is objectively better than anything else that was being offered at the time. In segment two, stay tuned for this. You will, you will hear exactly why the Chrysler Airflow was as great as it is. You will hear exactly why. You'll hear specifications. You'll hear specifications compared to other cars of the time period. And you'll see why exactly it made such an impact on the automotive world. So please stay tuned, folks. Are you a business owner? Someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. Okay, welcome back. So this is segment two. We are going to be discussing the specifications of the Chrysler Airflow. In segment one, we discussed um, the introduction to the car and some of the reasons why it ultimately failed in the public eye. But let's de dive deeper into why the, the Chrysler and the DeSoto Airflow, really the Chrysler Airflow cars of the time period. That's more of an accurate statement. Why these cars were so revolutionary and why they were so starkly different from the other cars being offered at the time. Okay, so the specs of the cars are largely the same. I'm going to give you the specs of the top of the line models, which were the Chrysler models. So the Chrysler Airflow was 122 to 130 horsepower inline eight engine. It was 4.9 to 5.3 liters. And I'm not saying this as somehow the specs of the engine change from car to car. This was at the beginning of the lineup. It was 122 horsepower, 4.9 liter engine in 1934. And by the end of production in 1937, it was a 130 horsepower, 5.3 liter engine. That's why these numbers are changing. Uh, the Chrysler version had several variants. The largest was the CW Airflow Custom Imperial. The smallest was the Airflow 8. And in the in-betweens were the CV Airflow Imperial 8 and the CX Airflow Custom Imperial. The unibody design offered rigidity and praiseworthy handling characteristics. These cars were critically acclaimed by the car reviewers of the day. Which is another thing that kind of gets me, you know, irked. I'm like, if these cars were critically acclaimed 
by the professionals. What on earth is the public's problem? We don't know what the public's problem is that. Uh, they, they, they don't have a real problem to not like the car. There's no reason why these cars shouldn't have been selling like hotcakes. But anyway, moving on. The whole body, as a result, was all steel, resulting in a much safer, more durable body shell in an era where most cars, get this, folks, most cars of this time period were wooden framed body shells covered with steel mounted on a separate chassis. You're literally driving around in wooden cars in the 1930s. And by this time, cars were getting fast. It was not uncommon for your car to have over 70 horsepower by the 1930s. Granted, probably some of the cheaper cars like Ford Model A's still probably produced around 40 to 50 horsepower, but it was not uncommon for cars to be produced with 70 to 100 horsepower even, which a few decades earlier, just two decades earlier in the 1910s would have been absolutely unheard of. So by this time, it was not uncommon for cars to be fast. It was not uncommon for cars to have, you know, proper brakes. Granted, I can't say hydraulic brakes didn't come for another couple of decades, but good proper mechanical brakes. You know, as Henry Ford would say, the safety from steel from pedal to wheel. This, you know, cars were becoming formidable vehicles. They were no longer horseless carriages. The car had, had you know, picked up its face, so to speak. It was here to stay and had begun to look more and more like a car, as we know it today. Cars were becoming formidable vehicles, and many of them, most of them, were still wood and steel bodies, Mounted on a separate chassis. This a death trap waiting to happen. You know, they did a test on this Chrysler Airflow back in the day. They dropped this thing off of a 110-foot cliff. They just dropped it. And then when the car got to the bottom of the cliff, they simply flipped the car back over and drove it away. Granted... Any car that you drop off of a 110-foot cliff is going to be battered. But the car was still recognizable, and it was still able to drive away. I bet you if you did that to a modern Chrysler, you couldn't do that. But this Chrysler Airflow of that time period, you had done that to a Duesenberg Model J. You couldn't drive that car away. You had done that to a Ford Model T. You couldn't do that away. And by the time, by this time, the 1930s, there are still millions of Model Ts on the road. Even though they had stopped producing them in 1927, when you take 15 million were produced and how long these cars lasted, you bet your sweet buns, goodness, there was millions of Model Ts still on the road at the time. And these cars were competing against modern cars of this time period. Modern cars that were heavier and more powerful, and but not as safe. You're driving wooden cars, essentially, around. And then somebody comes out with an all-steel body that's unibody. You would think that the public would breathe a sigh of relief, like, oh my gosh, thank goodness we're not driving those death traps anymore. Somebody's finally made a car that's safe. Even after doing this publicity stunt that proves the car is safe. No, they just, they just weren't having it. So it, it's just, it, it's, it's dumbfounding. Let me, let me move on, folks. There were rumors spread that the Airflow's design was unsafe despite being categorically, categorically false. These contributed to the Airflow's failure. Imagine this. You do a test in which you drop your car off of a 110-foot cliff, you flip it back over, and then you drive away, and the car is perfectly fine mechanically. And then yet, people have the gall to keep on spreading rumors about your car saying that it's unsafe when they're making wooden cars covered in steel mounted on a separate chassis. I, the, the sheer ridiculousness of, ga of that gets me every single time. I just can't, I can't even imagine. But moving on. Weight distribution 
was another big sticking point with these cars. It was that of a modern car. Get this. If any of you all out there play the Forza Motorsport um, series of video games, you know when you're tuning your car, weight distribution matters. And you know in the specs window of when you're purchasing a car, you can toggle it. And then you can find out what the weight distribution is over your front axle. And then by math, you can find out what it is over your rear axle. Now, you will find that most cars, especially if they're front engine cars, carry their weight up above the front axle. And to the tune of eh, 53 to 55% of the car's weight is above the front axle. And then the rest, which is a eh, 47 to 45 percent of the car's weight is over the rear axle. Do you know what it was in the Chrysler Airflow? 54 percent over the front axle and 46 percent over the rear axle. Cars of the day of the 1930s commonly carried a shocking 65 to 75 percent of their weight over the rear axles, which had its own host of problems. Let me give you an example. These made the cars terrible. And by terrible, I don't mean terrible by modern standards. I mean terrible of the standards of the day, too. Terrible to handle. Unstable. Unsafe. Very light in the front, extremely heavy in the back. Spring ratios were all out of whack because the front suspension could afford to be a lot softer than the rear suspension. The suspension in the back had to be a lot stiffer to accommodate that weight of wood and that weight of steel mounted on a separate chassis. And uh, suspensions of the day were not your multi-link, you know, independent suspensions or your McPherson struts of today, folks. These were leaf springs, which were literally bands of metal welded together that would flex under the weight of a car. These were leaf springs. Harsh riding vehicles, poor handling characteristics, and at times even unsafe. And frankly, that's the reason why these cars could not be driven extremely fast. Because even if you were to do that, you would get to a point where your car was so skittish and unstable that you wouldn't be able to continue to drive it at that speed, even if it was capable. And then you get a car that has completely revolutionized the way even weight distribution was taken. 54% over the front, 46% over the rear. Just like a modern car. Made handling a breeze. Made turning a breeze. Made stability almost, you know, a given when you saw the design of the car and how it was actually engineered and put together. And not only this, instead of the common flat windshields of the day, that would basically be a rectangle moving through the air as aerodynamic as a brick. The windshield was two pieces instead of the common flat windshields. And it was raked in such a way that it was angled towards the front of the car so that it would split the air as the car was going through. Not only this, imagine how much gas this car would have saved Versus your other car. Granted that a huge inline eight cylinder engine, especially by today's standards, the engine is absolutely massive. Nobody's putting inline eight engines in their cars anymore. And even with the eight, eight, eight cylinder engines, most of them aren't pushing four point, yeah, four point something liters. This was 5.3 liters. With an absolutely massive engine, that take it with a grain of salt as you may. Imagine how great the fuel mileage of a Chrysler Airflow would have been compared to the cars of the other day, or compared to the other cars of that day, I should say. Just, just think about it. Just think about it. You're driving a car that the, the fenders are sticking out. 
the radiator is sticking straight up. You got a flat windshield and you got headlights that are freestanding units. And you've got two box design in which your car is basically at the bare bones, two rectangles with a bunch of frilly bits tacked onto it. And you're driving this thing through the air, through the atmosphere. Imagine the wind resistance. Imagine the horrible gas mileage. Imagine everything. And then take the Chrysler Airflow. That has solved all the problems of the cars of the day. Yeah, it looked weird. At least by that standard. Uh, but by today, goodness, I mean, the car is gorgeous. But people didn't like it. People didn't like it. And that's just to prove you. There is something about human nature. If people are not ready for a change, no matter what you do, you can't convince them to adopt it. If they're not ready for the change, you can't get them to adopt the change. And that, that folks, is really sad. And that's human nature for you. Human nature ultimately is what decided the fate of the Chrysler Airflow. You'll hear more about that in segment four with my own thoughts, but we're going to take a break here. And after the break, we're going to go into segment three. Segment three is going to discuss some of the other cars of the time period and some history that was going on during the 1930s that you should know about. So please stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Okay, welcome back, folks. So, in segment two, we discussed the specifications of the Chrysler Airflow and how it was, frankly, objectively the best car that you could buy in America at the time. I mean, if, if we're going to say anything, it was the best car. Uh, by modern standards, definitely the best car. Whether, the, whether it was the most desirable or not, goodness, that you would have to talk to the people of the time period. But it was definitely the best car. So now we're going to be talking about some of the other cars that were being offered around the world at the time, as well as some of the other things that were going on in the world at the time. So during the 1930s, the Bentley 8 liter had debuted uh, um, in England. It's made, it had made its debut, I should say. And it was a legendarily powerful car. Much like a Duesenberg. Get this. These Bentley 8 liters, by the name suggesting, had 8 liter engines. This is abs like absolutely massive, first of all. And these cars were, I would say, your modern day predecessors to things like the Bentley Continental, Bentley Flying Spur, Bentley Continental GT, Bentley Speed 6, Bentley all of that. All of the really fast, extremely luxurious, real grand tourer sort of, you know, reputation that Bentley has today, it started with the Bentley 8 liter. Bentley 8 liter, I mean, W.O. Bentley, and you'll hear Jay Leno rant about this man. I mean, W.O. Bentley was an engineer of the ages. I, uh, you know, the thing is, these Bentleys, 
their their engines were super low stressed super low stress i mean these cars they would lump along at 900 a thousand rpm i mean 3000 rpm was the end of the world these cars were so unbelievably reliable that you know just like jay lena would say you could find a bentley eight liter engine in a field you dust it off you start it up right away and then you could drive for hundreds of miles. They were that reliable. Granted, these engines were not easy to work on. And maybe someday in the future, when this segment is, when this uh, um, series is over, I will do a dedicated podcast on the Bentley 8 liter. The engines were complex. They were not easy to work on, but they were extremely reliable because they were large. They were low stressed. And the technology of the day could not support such an engine design to the point that W.O. Bentley just redesigned the engine in such a way that most people were not doing it that way at the time. So not only did he redesign the engine, he was able to make it in such a way that it was reliable. And that's the story of the, uh, the, you know, the Bentley 8 later. Moving on. The Bugatti Royale. The Bugatti Royale was one of the largest cars ever made and was the longest production car ever made at 21 feet long. Now, the Bugatti Royale was originally supposed to be a very limited production car in which it was not as limited as it was. They weren't planning on making it limited as limited as it ended up being, but it was supposed to be a car that Bugatti was going to produce 25 of them for the Royal families of Europe so that they can buy as the most luxurious car that they could buy at the time period. Here was the issue though. It's no secret that the great depression was going on at this time period. It's no secret that the Great Depression was going on at this time period, and people of power, people who had money, it was seen as almost the temperate thing to do to not spend exorbitant amounts of money on luxury cars during this time period where most of the world is in the grips of the Great Depression economic hardship that is unprecedented for the lives of many people who were around at the time. They did not sell very well, the Bugatti Royales. And frankly, not it's not that they did not sell very well. That's not what I should say. They didn't produce many, many of them because nobody was going to buy them. So they only produced seven. Ettore Bugatti um, crashed the last one. So only six remain to this day. They were 21 feet long, and they were about 20% longer than a modern-day Rolls-Royce Phantom and about 25% heavier than a modern-day Rolls-Royce Phantom, which, as you know, is probably the largest production car in production today. And this was about 20% heavier and 20% longer than it is. So this car was huge. Uh, This is a Bugatti Royale we're talking about here. You know Bugatti as making, you know, super fast automobiles. But Bugatti had its hand in some luxury cars of the day as well. The Fiat 500 Topolino. This is an adorable city car, which is made by the Italian company Fiat, which, fun fact, Topolino means little mouse. And the car actually did look like a little mouse. It was the predecessor to the Fiat 500 that we know of that the modern Fiats are designed after. This was the predecessor to that original Fiat 500 that we the design is so recognizable today. I covered this car, not this car, but the Fiat 500 in my podcast on the beloved European economy cars of old. I covered it in that uh, two-part podcast. And then uh, um, another fun fact about this car is that um, Little Mouse Topolino is the official Italian name for Mickey Mouse. So there you have it. Mickey Mouse is named after the car, car named after Mickey Mouse, whatever you want to say it, whoever came first, 
Mickey Mouse shares the name with the car in the at least in an Italian in the Italian language. Um, the history of the time period, as you all know. The stock market crash of 1929 ushered in a time of unprecedented economic hardship known as the Great Depression. The Roaring Twenties was quite something, folks. I I know it sounds like I lived through it. I didn't live through it. Sometimes spiritually, I feel like I did. But the, yeah, the Roaring Twenties was quite something. Well, the, as any economic uh, prosperity goes, the bubble eventually bursts so to speak. And in 1929, it all came crashing down. By this time period, prohibitions also going on in the United States. The Great Depression has gripped the world. Um, This is, yeah, this is a bad time. And soon, uh, prohibition would no longer be a thing. In 1933, uh, prohibition eventually, you know, uh, you know, um, eventually ended, officially ended in 1933. And you could understand why, you know, people needed to drink a little bit in order for them to get through this rough time that was known as the Great Depression. Um Coupled with the Great Depression, a drought and decades of poor soil usage in the Midwestern and Western states of the United States caused a dust bowl um, that really, it, it's, 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 an odd, it's an odd phenomenon to think of as a modern person. Let me put this into perspective. The toil, the, 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 the soil was tilled in such a way that allowed the soil to become very loose. And this had been decades of farming on this land without modern farming methods that caused the soil to become very poor, to become very loose. Coupled with the fact that there was a drought in which it did not rain consistently for a long time, the soil basically turned to dust. It turned to powder. And what would happen... You know, the high winds on the plains of the Midwest and the Western United States would come through and would whip this dust that used to be the soil into large clouds. And dust storms would take over entire towns, would take over entire cities for days or weeks at a time. This was, this must have been apocalyptic. People would die from what was known as dust pneumonia. Dust pneumonia was a disease, or not really a disease so much. It was a phenomenon in which the dust particles were so fine that you breathe them in and they would get lodged in your lungs and prevent you from breathing. So really you would choke on the dust of the atmosphere, thus killing you. This was a bad time. I mean, there was mass migrations out of the plains of the Midwest. People went west to California, where there was better opportunity and the conditions were better. Or they went east to the East Coast. Or some went south. People were going in all directions to escape from the Dust Bowl. At the height of the Great Depression at that. It, this, was, this was not a good time, folks. And you can understand why... You know, certain cars of the time period, car manufacturers, you know, they suffered. They suffered. They suffered greatly because especially expensive cars, nobody wanted to be seen in an expensive automobile for the sheer, for the sheer lack of social competence, lack of social grace. The entire world is struggling. People are poor. People are dying. You know, you know, it, it's not a good time. It's not a good time. Natural disasters out the wazoo. You know, nobody was going to be buying something that was too ostentatious, too expensive, or too different in the case of the Chrysler Airflow. And that's, that's coupled with the mentality of people. That's what really did many cars in of the time period. So, like, cars like the Bentley 8 liter, as reliable as they were, they didn't sell many of them. Cars like the Duesenberg, as great as they were, they didn't sell many of them either. Cars like the Chrysler Airflow, as great as they were, 
as revolutionary as they were, people were not seeking revolutionary design at this time period. People were not even seeking, you know, cars so much. You got a car at this time period because it was necessary, but you bought what was necessary. You bought what you were familiar with. You bought what was new and frankly, something that would slip under the radar. So people didn't look at you if you were buying a new car and see you with resentment because you were doing better than most of the people at the time. That, yeah, that really, really did it for a lot of uh, um, cars that, you know, came from this time period. And another thing, um, the Hindenburg disaster of 1937 brought an end of inflatable Airbuses, blimps, whatever they called those things. It brought an end. Basically, these things, I believe it was helium or hydrogen, I believe. I think it was hydrogen balloons. Something like that. Point is, the gas they used was extremely flammable. And I think the the air, like the, the balloon that the gondola like rested underneath had caught fire and exploded. And I believe all of the people that were flying aboard the Hindenburg, it was a it was a, a, a German contraption of the time period, um all of the people on board died, and that really brought an end to this sort of thing. I mean, these were starting to become more popular, and frankly, they were bigger than airplanes. They made, you know, a, 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 you know inter a, intercontinental travel possible for some of the wealthiest people, the elite that could afford tickets to, you know, fly aboard one of these things. But yeah, the Hindenburg disaster really had done it. So this was, yeah, this was the 1930s for y'all. Um, definitely not a time to be alive. Uh, yeah, definitely not the greatest time period. Um, if any of you all have uh, great grandparents out there that are still alive and that live through this, I mean, just ask them about it. Anybody who was alive during the time period, uh, granted, if they were old enough to have memories, is going to remember the Great Depression. Um the 1930s. They're going to remember it. I mean, my girlfriend's grandmother was was born in 19, uh, 1927, I believe. 1926 or 1927. So she lived through the Great Depression, and she's old enough to tell some stories. I mean, it was... It was nuts, man. It was nuts. But, uh, yeah, that was going on in the world. So um, after this, this break, in segment four, we are going to be discussing my thoughts on the Chrysler Airflow and... That will be the end of our podcast, so please stay tuned. You work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television, and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered, whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand. Okay, welcome back, folks. Uh, so, um, this is segment four. You're going to hear my candid thoughts on the Chrysler Airflow. Segment one, we discussed the introduction to the car. Segment two, we discussed the specifications. Segment three, we discussed the other cars of the time period, as well as some of the history that was going on. And in segment four, you're going to hear my thoughts. Um, this car comes from the good days of Chrysler. Of course, what would a podcast about cars be if I didn't mention Chrysler and how much I despise them? However, I did not always despise Chrysler. I would say that I, you know, doing my car history, even as a young boy, 
I was enamored by Chryslers of old. They were just good looking cars. And even today, Chryslers are just good looking cars. And as, as crazy as this design was, the Chrysler Airflow, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. It's air, it's streamlined, it's modern, it's flowy, it's it's romantic, it's everything. It's ever it's it's beautiful. I mean, compared to some of the other cars in the time period, I mean, like, you know, the, the, the Duesenberg Model J, which is the one that we did in the last segment, the car from the 1920s, um, even though it was made in the 1920s, it, it lived most, m much of its life in the 1930s. It evolved in the 1930s. Uh, the Duesenberg Model J was gorgeous in a sheer presence sort of way. I saw one of these at the Tallahassee Automobile Museum. Um, it was, it was beautiful in, in presence. There was lots of chrome. It was long. It was, the roof was sort of chopped. I mean, it, it looked sleek and stylish of the day. But by today's standards, it's really tacky. Any car of that time period by today's standards is really tacky. But not so with the Chrysler Airflow. The Chrysler Airflow obviously looks like an old car. I mean, it was it was produced about 90 years ago now. You know, 88 years ago if we're being, 87 years ago if we're being exact. So it's an 87-year-old design. But it doesn't look as garish or as distasteful as car period as cars of the time period look it looked like what was an old interpretation of a modern car today instead of a contemporary interpretation of what a car was at the time period does that make sense it's like someone looked at a car from today and they made it look older instead of designing a car from the ground up like they would have because it was it, it it was very much like a modern car in terms of its styling with the pontoon styling flush headlamps a nice curving radiator grill uh, which is just the grill on a modern car a nice curving grill that flowed with the body of the car sweeping fenders and the fenders weren't sticking out as if though they were were different units from the car they were all integrated into the car's shape i mean this this looked like a normal car as far as everything not sticking off of you know what was essentially two rectangles it was distinctive. It was distinctive. And this this car is really, really modern by today's standards. It was, it, it is severely underrated as a classic car. I mean, I'm sure there's probably a Chrysler Airflow Club out there in which, you know, there's some guy who knows everything about these cars and he's like the president of this club and they all get together like once every couple of months for coffee and to discuss their Chrysler Airflows. There's probably one out there. If you're out there in the lonely world of podcast listeners, uh, give us a shout out or we'll give you a shout out or I don't know how that works. You know, just, just comment on one of our, you know, videos or something. Um, tell us about you. About, you know, the Chrysler airflows of the time period. But, um, yeah, it was, it, it is severely underrated. You see people freak out over the Tri-5 Chevys, the 55, the 56, and the 57 Bel Air. Uh, people like me freak out over Cadillacs of old. You know, like the 59 Cadillac Eldorado Buretz. You know, 30s cars, I freak out over things like the Duesenberg Model J. Even I'm guilty of this. I tend to forget that the Chrysler Airflow even existed. Honestly, when I was thinking of cars to do for the most influential car of the 1930s, the first car that came to mind was the Bentley 8 liter. But then I realized that the Bentley 8 liter is too similar in concept to the Duesenberg Model J. Very large, very luxurious car, very fast, very powerful. Yeah, we already did that with the Duesenberg Model J. Can't really do that with the Bentley, especially that they came from the same time period, essentially. One was late 20s, the other one was mid-30s. But really, they came from the time period. 
So it wouldn't be justifiable for me to be doing a car for the 1930s that was so similar to the car that I did for the 1920s. It just didn't make any sense in my mind. So as I'm doing research, the Chrysler Airflow pops into my mind. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to do the Chrysler Airflow. It is, it is it was the best car you could buy at the time, objectively by modern standards. Subjectively, not so much. You know, people would have looked at you funny during the Great Depression. You're driving this goofy looking thing. But by today's standards, in retrospect, hindsight is always 2020 or in this case, 2021. <laughs> you see what I did there? But anyway, um, it was really the best car that you could have bought for the time period by modern standards. The only problem, however, is that, of course, with a very new car like this, um, manufacturing was a struggle at first. So the first two to 3,000 cars, really, had some issues as far as manufacturing went, as far as build quality went, because they were still trying to iron out the issues that they were having. You know, Walter P. Chrysler was genuinely surprised by the poor reception of the car. And I guess I would have to take a page from his book when it comes to his reaction. Walter P. Chrysler, I feel like, had a very justified reaction. He was he was completely dumbfounded, you know, awestruck by the fact that the public didn't want anything to do with the Chrysler Airflow or the DeSoto Airflow or the Imperials of the time period that were also designed with this Airflow design. They didn't want anything to do with it. In fact, so much so that they had to come out with a more contemporary car built on the same platform form called the... Uh, um, Chrysler Airstream and the DeSoto Airstream they had to come out with a different car that was more traditionally styled in order to sell this platform which the Airstream wasn't nearly as aerodynamic as the Airflow the Airstream was more expressive it looked more aerodynamic with a, with a, you know, with a flowing thing the Airflow on the other hand was actually aerodynamic but they had to come out with the airstream in order to just appease the public that's how bad they had received the chrysler airflow i mean it, it, it just it doesn't make any sense you produce a car that is practical and that addresses all of the problems with cars of the time period and people just want nothing to do with it they would rather believe rumors and conspiracy theories that, oh, this car is somehow not safe, and they're trying to kill you, blah, 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 nah, nah, nah. Then they would rather believe the absolute facts. Sound familiar? Yeah. Modern people do the same thing, too. Human nature does not change. And just as we have it in politics today, that people would rather believe conspiracy theories than believe the cold, hard facts, they had it in cars of the time period. The mentality still rings the same. People would rather believe baseless claims that confirm their own bias than to actually look at the facts. And that's ultimately what killed the Chrysler airflow. Sad thing is Chrysler would not attempt this again. This, this was a page in Chrysler's book that was written and was hopeful but ended poorly. And much to the dismay of the aging Walter P. Chrysler at the time period, much to the dismay of car enthusiasts like myself of today who look back and were like, wow, this car should have, you know, outsold the Model T, frankly. I mean, not to say that they were extremely, you know, not to say that they were extremely cheap, but like in terms of pure engineering and everything, these cars should have outsold everything that was on the roads. It's, it's just, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Um, it makes me sad, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, it is what it is. You know, the thing is, the car was like a modern car on paper. I'm going to take my Buick Park Avenue, for example, because that's the car I'm the most familiar with. Frankly, that's the car I drive. 
I've got a 240, po- uh, 240 horsepower V6 engine driving the front wheels. Uh, my car is unibody. It's not body on frame. Last Buick to be body on frame was, huh, the Buick Roadmaster that was produced from 1993 to 1996, that B-body car. Um, it, it is pontoon styling, just like every car of the day is pontoon styling. Everything is flush with the car, nothing sticking off or looking weird. Um, yeah, that's my car. When you look at the Chrysler Airflow, Chrysler Airflow, weight distribution was that of a modern car. Design philosophy was that of a modern car. Engineering was that of a modern car. It looks like a modern car on paper before you actually take a look at it. And, of course, the engine is obviously of the time period. It was not like a V6 engine driving the front wheels or an I4 engine driving the front wheels like so many modern cars are. This was a I8 engine driving the rear wheels. But nonetheless, it was a unibody car. It was safe. It was practical. It made sense. And people just didn't buy it. You know, it makes me sad that it didn't catch on. But I'm not going to pretend like human nature changes. Human nature does not change. And so just as people were resistant to the idea of the Chrysler airflow of the time period, people are resistant to ideas of like electric cars today or alternative fuel vehicles. In which, granted, the facts are not there yet. The facts are not there yet, so I'm still one of those holdouts. I sound like a hypocrite, but I'm still one of those holdouts. I still believe in the internal combustion engine. I don't think electrical vehicles are going to be that near in the future as we think, unless some some fundamental change happens in the infrastructure and the way society works. I don't think they're going to be as, as you know, as soon as we think but even then not everybody thinks like me you know the public is loving tesla and they're just buying it all up so i i just i don't get it man i don't get it but that's the story of the chrysler airflow that's the story of the chrysler airflow that's the story of the desoto airflow a car that was the best car of the time period objectively by modern standards was rejected by the public Uh, struggled to sell and largely forgotten by people of today so there you have it it's sad it's sad Uh, it didn't need to be this sad but that's what happened so thank you so much for listening to this edition of the gsmc car podcast um brought to you by the gsmc podcast network um please follow us on instagram we have a new instagram account hence why we're doing this series please follow us on twitter please like us on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Spreaker, and on YouTube. Follow, leave a comment, and please let us know what you think is the most influential car of all time. Whether you agree with my estimation so far, or whether you have something different to say, we would love to hear you. So please stay tuned for the next episode that should be coming out soon. And y'all take care, and have a good night. You've been listening to the GSMC Car Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's episode.